afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Neda. Uh, I would like to first thank the organizers for inviting me. It's a pleasure to be part of this webinar. Um, today, I will be sharing the recent uh, research findings in our lab toward understanding the neural basis of behavioral robustness and flexibility. Uh, in other words, how, to, uh, how do neuronal responses translate into robust and flexible behavioral outcome of the brain? Um, at first, I will motivate the idea of robustness and flexibility using some example behavioral functions uh, of the brain. Um, understanding uh, how behavior is generated through the integration of sensory, motor, cognitive information is always a fundamental goal in systems neuroscience for those of you who are more uh, coming from the neuroscience background. And uh, one of the hallmarks of the brain is that our behavior remains robust uh, despite large variations in the sensory and non-sensory uh, factors. Here I'm going to just uh, make some examples or list a few examples of variability in the context of visual processing. But this ability holds for other sensory modalities like audition or for other sources of variabilities than what I'm uh, listing here. Uh, for example, uh, neurons have only two orders of magnitude, single neurons in the brain. And by the way, brain cells are called uh, neurons, again, for those of you who are not coming from neuroscience background. Uh, neurons have uh, two orders of magnitude, uh, dynamic range, when they are going to um, detect and respond to the luminance in the visual scene. Uh, from very uh, bright area like uh, outside this cove uh, versus uh, inside. Um, however, you can experience nine orders of magnitude change in brightness uh, or luminance of the scene. So how come neurons with only two orders of magnitude dynamic range can enable us uh, uh, navigate in the scene with this wide range of uh, magnitude uh, in change of or change in the magnitude of brightness? Um, let's go to another example. Um, neurons also can ad adapt uh, your, our visual system, I would say, uh, can adapt uh, its processing into the range of contrast in the visual scene. For example, you can see from 100% contrast of the zebra to very low contrast of this uh, scene like lion in the meadow. Uh, we can easily uh, process the objects and scene in both um, uh, situations. Um, another example that our visual system um, shows our visual system uh, capability is that uh, our visual system also um, can uh, process across patterns. For example, you can see these kind of uniform, low informative sky regions or ocean regions versus uh, this high resolution coastal region with all the details about the um, sands, vegetations, rocks, uh, etc. Okay. Um, we also, our, um, our visual system is robust um, or invariant uh, in, um, across different viewing conditions. So no matter how far or close the objects are uh, uh, near to you or how they are oriented in the scene or what your viewing angle is, how you rotate your head or eyes with respect to the location of the object. The objects are still, or they're moving. No matter what viewing condition we are talking about, um, we can process uh, this scene very robustly. This kind of robustness requires the brain to have the ability to reliably encode relevant information and reject undesirable input all in real time. Okay, that was about the robustness in visual uh, processing as an example of uh, brain uh, functions or robust brain functions. Okay. Um, now let's uh, go to another uh, hallmark of the brain. Uh, and that is we, you know, we can switch our behavior again in real time, depending on the context, um, uh, depending on the goal or task at hand, depending our learning state, cognitive state. Um, in other words, our brain can flexibly read the visual scene, read out the visual scene for us. Again, I'm providing some examples uh, from visual behavior, but this also is true for other behaviors. Um, so let's see the first example. Here you will see 
an image and I'm going to point out to these two surfaces. The first one and the bottom uh, and the bottom, uh, the top one and the bottom one. Uh, you may all agree that the top one is grayish, uh, the uh, lower one is whitish. Now I'm going to cover this shared boundary areas between the two surfaces, uh, but I keep the image the same. And now you tell me what you see um, in the color of the two surfaces. Now everyone agrees that they are both grayish. So how come by just covering the boundary region, your um, um, sense of uh, color, I mean the better word uh, is the perception of the color would be different. So if you uh, fit these two patches, these two patches um, to a photometer and measure the light spectrum in the two regions, they are the same. The spectrum, the light spectrum comes out the same. Um, so, but why our perception is different? Um, so a quick answer would be that our perception is influenced by our expectation. We assume some uh, priors to infer a color in the scene. Um, so in that sense, the same input, depending on those expectation could be perceived differently. Um, in this sense, um, or in this example, the spectral context that makes the uh, difference here, uh, this middle shading that I'm hiding here has a lot con uh, of contribution to our perception of color. And the light source, uh, this shadow, um, the chromatic content of the background, they are all contribute to the expectation of um, their top surface should be gray, the bottom surface should be white, although both of them were gray. Okay. This is also called illusion, and we did, we have illusion of vision almost all the time, and not sense of vision. Okay. Let's go to another example of, um, we call it flexibility, and that is our visual attention. Okay. Here, um, you are uh, fixating somewhere, this uh, lady is looking at the book, um, um, but the visual scene around him could um, remains um, similar over time, but at each moment of time, she has the ability to process a particular part of the visual scene. Um, I mean, she can, um, without moving uh, her eyes, can process information about this part or about this part of the scene. Uh, even uh, she can switch between auditory versus visual and on lots of other functions all at the same time. So this is a very, um, unique or uh, magnificent uh, example of um, our flexibility in uh, real time. Or let's uh, consider this uh, visual task, which uh, we call it visual search task. Uh, once you are told that find the red symbols, um, all, whatever is red in here. Um, so in that sense, you ignore the pattern. Um, it, it doesn't matter if it is X or T or it's a cross or T. Um, and you pr try to optimize uh, for color detection when the task is uh, red versus um, green um, discrimination. Um, another time, you are told that find all the crosses in the scene. Uh, in this uh, um, situation, you ignore color and optimize for pattern discrimination. Okay. So you can, depending on the task, um, you, you can see a different representation of the same scene in your brain. So, um, although the scene remains the same, how it is represented in your brain in the response of the neurons in the in the brains uh, will be in the brain will be different. In other words, our readout is flexible because now the representation is different, so uh, the um, outcome will be different too. And uh, let's see this uh, last uh, example. And in this example, I'm going to highlight um, the power of our visual perception. Um, if, even um, in, the, in the context that um, for the AI type of workshop, you, are, you may be more familiar with. And uh, so th this is the case that uh, nowadays the computers are performing even better than humans in object recognition in several tested applications. But in spite of that, here I'm just showing an example or situation where a computer will be challenged uh, to, for example, differentiate between um, uh, mops and ship dots in these images. Okay. Uh, but for a human, it is an effortless job uh, to tell the difference. Okay. 
Um, so this is, I'm just going to highlight the difference between the brain processing and other artificial uh, processing, at least uh, so far. And, and keep in mind that recent advances in AI are mostly enabled by increasing computing power. We have supercomputers that they can do everything fast. And the other thing is the availability of large data sets. Okay. So these, these are the things that um, now the AI or the computer vision, uh, intelligent computer vision uh, systems um, are relying on. Um, on the other hand, our brain can accomplish this task without requiring large sample data. And for some of you, indeed, this may be our, uh, your first time seeing a sheepdog or a mob of this, mob of this texture, right? So even without seeing these images before, you are able to see uh, which is mob, which is a uh, uh, sheepdog image. And, and in addition, um, brain is a low technology hardware compared to um, all these state-of-the-art computer chips like those used for training deep networks. So by no means brain uh, has um, in, the, in that level of technology in terms of and the uh, processing units and communications that, that we have in the brain. So the computer processing, for those of you uh, I mean, that may not uh, be familiar with the context of brain versus uh, computer, um, in the computer processing, um, we, um, communication or processing in computers are via electrons, um, but our uh, brain, the processing in our brain is via ions. Um, neural signaling uh, requires the flux of huge number of ions. Ions are much heavier, uh, I would say 70,000 times more massive than an electron almost. They are extremely larger and they are much slower than electrons. Uh, yet our biological vision works in real time. So electrons are um, uh, moving in the speed of light, but ions um, with this much of mass and speed, and they are so sluggish with respect to computers, but our vision works in real time. And the other point is that our biological system uh, is noisy uh, because of all the chemical activities and mechanical movements, uh, while electrons or um, in or I would say electronic devices who are based on um, electron um, uh, movement, um, they're especially, and especially the, the digital ones, uh, they are so precise. Um, so a, a bit of perturbation in the, um, in the bits that are um, coded or they are going to be um, transferred in the computer, a bit of the disturbance or perturbation there will um, crash the entire function of the computer. But our biological vision works in a super robust way, although it is a very noisy system, or there are lots of stochasticity in, 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 the, in the biological system. And, but all the, um, I mean, all together, at the end of the day, in many real world scenarios, our slow, noisy brain hardware beats big time, the precise, super fast digital processors. Um, and this implies that the power of the brain is in algorithms, is in the software of the brain. And this is another, um, known example of the um, computer vision application and one of the challenges in the computer vision applications uh, at least so far uh, which ask a computer to differentiate between the blueberry muffin um, or a, a ciabatta um, in these images okay. and, and i think that makes human distinct from machines in successfully performing this uh, task uh, is a co cognitive ability that we have that is called perception. We actually do not see the world as images captured by a camera, like these images that I'm showing here. Um, rather, we perceive the visual world as we interact with the environment, um, and it is basically whatever brain um, um, represented for us, or how brain represented for us. And, and basically, in a sense, uh, our brain represent and encode the visual scene in a way to extract or infer, uh, infer useful uh, information for our behavior. Okay? The, the way that brain wants to work, the representation of the visual scene would be that way. And today, um, I would like to uh, make some um, example from our own work, um, which is um, going to highlight the flexibility and robustness of our uh, behavior. Um, and um, we see um, in the um, just few um, slides. 
Um, I'm just wanted to emphasize um, here before I move to my um, the research results in our lab is that and the brain ability to uh, both produce a robust vision in the presence of large variations in the external input like these um, difference in the statistics of the scene uh, or based on the internal goal, for example, differentiating between um, patterns or differentiating between um, colors and the ability to produce this robust behavior um, in the presence of uh, all these changes uh, are based on um, certain computation in the uh, neural processing. And it is basically a sophisticated aspect of our natural uh, behavior. And we are going to um, investigate how responses in the brain will translate into robustness and flexibility. So let's um, go through a specific topic that we, um, I'm, um, we are pursuing in our lab, or research topic we are pursuing in our lab. And I will see how one of these examples of robustness and flexibility will be studied uh, in our lab. Um, so the punchline is that from this uh, flexibility and robustness, all these will result in our visual system to be a dynamic system. Uh, to be a constructive process. If we want to be robust, if we want to be flexible, we have to change. Our visual system should change over time uh, to accommodate the goals or the, the differences in the input. Uh, so in that sense, the uh, brain is constructing the visual world for us. Uh, and that is the consequence of, um, uh, or the implications, I would say, the implications of the um, um, robustness of flexibility in the visual behavior. Okay. Um, and this is the particular example that I'm going to mention here. Um, basically, uh, this is about uh, how, um, or the question that we are interested to answer is that how we perceive time and location uh, during our constant eye movement. This is an exemplar of such robust and flexible visual behavior. When we move our eyes, a large image shift is projected onto, uh, onto the back of the eye, which is called the retina. And let's see first uh, um, in the eye of a neuron, um, how these eye movements will be affecting the processing of a neuron. Um, so this is um, one video that I'm going to show you that is going to um, highlight what, what's happening um, in single neurons in the brain, in, in, the visual, in one of the visual um, areas. Uh, so when uh, we are uh, fixating um, or, uh, at some point in the visual scene, when our gaze is just fixated at a particular uh, location, each neuron will see a specific part of the visual scene. You can see, for example, for a sample neuron, and that neuron only sees this part of the scene. In other words, it only receives visual information from uh, this uh, small uh, area on the scene, and we call it the receptive field of a neuron. And each neuron has the different locations for the receptive field, and all of the neurons together will tile the entire visual scene uh, for us. Okay, um, but when we move our eyes, uh, the image that falls inside the receptive field of a neuron rapidly and drastically changes. I play this video and you can see how uh, that uh, change will uh, look like. But the um, point is that the um, scene that we are perceiving is not jumpy or um, like this kind of shift that we experience in our actual visual um, uh, processing when we move our eyes. Uh, when we move our eyes, the um, scene will remain stable um, you know, smooth, integrated, um, and this is basically what I mean um, by um, the constructive aspect of a vision. The input to the brain all is um, all these um, shifts and jumps in the image, but the outcome of the brain is a very smooth, stable uh, visual scene. And this is the behavior or um, perception or a, a phenomena that we call it perceptual stability or visual stability across um, eye movement. And specifically, I'm talking about saccadic eye movement, meaning that those eye movements that are jump and um, are jumpy uh, or ballistic, uh, they are large and they are fast. And these are the type of eye movement that, uh, that we do when we are uh, scanning the visual world around us, when we are going to deploy our attention at a specific point in time, or we are going to bring a specific object of interest into 
our uh, center of the um, eye or center of the retina, we call it phobia, for higher resolution processing. And these are all saccadic eye movement, and in a simple, more simple term, I refer to as saccades. So saccades are just uh, rapid eye movements. Um, and um, uh, I'm going to see how that stability is coming out of the neural processing. So this is another um, example. So that was for the single neuron. This is our um, ultimate perception. So when um, we move our eyes, and indeed we move our eyes three times a second on average, even four times a second on average to scan the visual scene. Uh, and every time that we move our eyes, these huge image shifts are projected onto the retina, similar to these video frames captured by a moving uh, camera. But the fact is that we do not see the, uh, or perceive the visual world like this. Otherwise, we would have gone crazy uh, with all these constant uh, eye movements. Um, and the point is that understanding how our visual system um, interpolates between all these different snapshots of image as we move our eyes, as we sample from the visual scene, um, and we do it that so in real time will contribute uh, to the uh, illusion of vision, and it's a necessary step for understanding the vision as uh, the constructive or one constructive uh, processing in the brain. Okay, let's uh, uh, see uh, quick, quickly how uh, so far we know uh, brain uh, will achieve uh, this uh, functionality or how it would, it would be possible that uh, this uh, functionality um, that brain can implement. Uh, first of all, um, we know that or this is, this is uh, one of the understanding that we have some evidence for uh, that the, our retina, as I said, as I say, it's a first layer of visual processing or visual neural processing, and that layer is in the back of our eyes. And the retina will shut down during eye movement. So it means that actually uh, we are blind or almost blind during eye movement. No information from the visual scene will be transferred into the brain uh, during eye movement. That's one mechanism, and in that sense, you can see that this um, um, blindness episode of uh, retina will help eliminate the uh, motion smear or the, those kind of um, motion blur that will be induced by more movements of the eye. But at the same time, um, if you shut down this part and nothing will go into the brain, it means that at some points, as you move your eyes, um, when, the, when your eyes are on the fly, you have to see some blank images in between the samples from the scene. But the fact is that we do not see the word like um, um, some snapshots of the visual scene interleaved by blank images. So it uh, suggests that somewhere higher up in the brain, in the visual cortex, um, so it's a retina and this is the uh, thalamus and this is the primary visual cortex all the way to higher level of visual processing, somewhere up uh, in the brain should fill a gap. Uh, in other words, it should interpolate between these uh, snapshots. It could reconstruct the entire visual world across time. And this across time is very important. This is what what um, most of the um, artificial system uh, miss or have to miss because of the complexity um, in um, uh, very um, much uh, visual applications that exist uh, or successfully uh, can uh, successfully operate in, in almost um, real world or complex uh, visual scene uh, conditions. Okay. Um, but overall, um, the, how this will be possible um, our visual scene will not have access to information uh, about the visual scene because the retina shuts down. And so where that information is coming from, and this is known that again, some evidence exists, but it is an open area of research that uh, areas in the brain that are responsible about um, for, for control of eye movement, uh, and th these are, it could be um, parietal cortex or um, um, prefrontal uh, cortex or area frontal eye field, uh, here uh, specifically, they will communicate to visual areas. So they have access to the position of the eye, to the um, all the plans that we are going for the movement of the eyes. So um, they will tell the visual areas that, okay, the eyes are about to move, change your processing. Otherwise, our perception would be that distorted and uh, jumpy um, um, visual scene. 
so this is just open, um, um, general understanding, but there are lots of open qu uh, questions, and these are even not uh, confirmed necessarily. Uh, the complexity, um, I would say, uh, for the for these studies, they are both uh, um, in the experimental aspects of the work and uh, of the work, and also in the uh, computational um, aspect of the world, um, work. Um, so, for example, um, all the uh, changes in the uh, processing or in response of the neurons and all the behaviors that are generated out of this change in the responses will happen over millisecond time scale. So the entire duration of eye movement, single eye movement, is about 30 to 40 millisecond. So all these changes in the responses and in the signaling, in the processing, and the readout of these representation should happen in this few milliseconds. So you can imagine that how it would be difficult both for the measurements from the uh, brain and also for and the report from the uh, subjects, it could be animals or it could be human, um, about their, um, how they perceive um, the visual world when they are um, uh, told to do some specific visual task during eye movement. So that the time scale will challenge both the measurements of the physiological signals and also measurement of the behavioral signals. And specifically for the case of visual stability, another challenge is that how, how we measure. It's not just um, it, we do not have enough time to measure it. So how you want to ask a subject, uh, a, a human participant, for example, that do you see the scene integrated or not integrated, stable or unstable? How much on, um, stability you would experience? These, these are not um, even possible, um, but at the end of the day, there are hard experiments uh, to do. And the other complexity is that all the computations that are done uh, in, within the neurons or communication in the uh, neurons um, at the level of how the information is encoded or represented in the neurons responses and how the behavioral information is read out or decoded from the um, responses, they all also happen in on millisecond time scale. So if you want to describe the encoding and decoding processing over just 30, 40 millisecond, that would challenge um, every uh, modeling approaches, every computational approaches that you want to use to describe and the input and output um, relationship during eye movement. When the input is visual seen, the output is the uh, response of the neuron, and ultimately uh, the readout of the response. Um, maybe I'm just uh, skipping um, the, uh, the details of this slide, but uh, let me just describe what we mean by neural responses uh, for those of you who, again, who are not coming from the neuroscience uh, background. Here, I just, uh, show quickly how, um, well, actually I have to turn, keep it on. Um, basically here I'm, uh, on, on the computer monitor, there will be some uh, patch of uh, Gabor stimulus, uh, this kind of moving bar will be presented. And we put the electrode in, in the brain, inside of the macaque brain. And we are recording from area MT for the example that I'm showing here for middle temporal areas. That is the area that is uh, responsible for processing motion um, information in the visual scene. And you see that when um, that, that stimulus is present, that visual um, stimulus will be presented, the response of the neurons will be these kind of fluctuations in the voltage that are recorded uh, using the electrodes. And the electrodes uh, could be single um, electrode or could be this array uh, electrode. Um, and there are other designs of the electrode as well. But and the signals will be picked up by these contacts um, uh, along the uh, electrodes and those signals are looking like this. So here I'm showing the visual um, image uh, or the visual stimulus and the recording and uh, that will be done in the lab. So here is the patch and the, the um, sound you hear is the response of the neuron. Whenever neurons respond, these fluctuations, you hear the sound. Uh, you hear the sound. Um, and these are the um, recording on the oscilloscope, for example, that comes out of uh, the electrodes. Okay? Um, so basically here you're uh, hearing a, a neuron. 
Um, you can, um, I mean, what the events that are important are these fluctuations, this, this uh, rapid fluctuation. And if you say that, okay, this, the, only the time of this fluctuation uh, would matter, then I can detect the time of these events using some thresholding operation. Um, and then all the things that go above this uh, uh, threshold will be the signal of interest. We call it action uh, potential or a spikes. Um, and we would have a train of a spikes, or we call it the spike trains, uh, from each recording after doing this uh, thresholding. And there are some details of this, I will ignore that, but this is the whole um, computational um, uh, algorithm that, uh, require, that we require is beyond uh, just threshold and threshold operations. But at the end of the day, this will be the outcome of that um, spark detection and sorting. And so you can see that as, the, uh, as a result, and the response of a neuron is just this binary sequence, zeros and ones. Zeros um, represent the silence, episode of the response and one is the time of the um, action potentials all, all these uh, high uh, fluctuations or the time of the spikes and then um, the fact that every time that a stimulus is presented to a neuron the neuron will respond differently uh, talks to the stochasticity um, or a stochastic property of the neural response. So that's why I'm saying that it is not just a binary process, it is a binary point process. And so it's not just a, um, a binary signal, it is a binary point process, uh, meaning that uh, it is an, um, um, a stochastic process which is binary. Okay? And all the um, computational work, all the modeling that we are doing are based on describing these discrete events based on the input uh, to the brain. So let's uh, skip um, the, um, what is called, uh, the experiment itself um, and uh, um, how we are recording the response. But at the end of the day, um, these are the um, outputs that we are going to describe how they were um, uh, generated from the um, during the uh, visual task that a monkey or human is doing. So here the results are for monkeys for sure because we cannot go invasive in, in humans. And uh, so we can record invasively from monkeys using these electrodes. And uh, because monkeys a visual system uh, in, and also the uh, monkeys visual perception and cognitive abilities is, are, are so close uh, to human, any understanding uh, in monkeys will be um, shedding light onto understanding of the human uh, visual uh, processing, uh, both at the level of um, sensing um, the information and representing information into neural responses and also at the level of um, perception, which is read out of those uh, visual uh, information. Um, so the question that we are going to answer, so let, let me just describe this um, picture very quickly. So um, this, uh, because we have multi-electrode um, array, uh, so we can pick up the response of multiple neurons. Here I'm just uh, showing five example neurons out of each uh, recording session. And because we are uh, repeating the um, uh, task or, or the experiment multiple time, the same visual input, the same eye movement task, we have uh, several trials uh, recorded for individual neurons. So each line in here, which uh, are composed of these uh, white uh, blank uh, areas and these vertical uh, black uh, bars uh, represent the spike time. Each of these lines will represent and one session of recording. So we will, you will have for each recording session uh, re uh, responses of multiple neurons and thousands of trials. Here is just I'm showing sample, five sample trials. We have thousands of trials for each um, neuron. And the goal is to uh, describe the relationship between the visual inputs, which is the um, images that are projected onto the retina uh, during eye movement, um, or the visual scene itself, and these responses, zeros and ones, uh, coming out of the brain. Um, so if I want to just um, model uh, this processing um, mathematically, the goal is that um, to find the um, system that could be considered a proxy of the brain that is able to uh, generate the same uh, output of the brain given this input uh, to and that, that system. Okay, so what that uh, system is. 
And if we want to go um, with a statistical approach in this um, uh, for, for this question or answering this question, uh, because as I said, uh, the um, response of the neurons are stochastic. Uh, so we have to describe the statistical properties of the, um, the zeros and ones, the exact occurrence of the zeros and ones, exact timing of them is not meaningful because each time that I present the same uh, stimulus, I will get a different response uh, up, to up to some statistical um, uh, constraint or properties. Uh, so here, I'm, um, if I want to just simplify that statistical approach, what I'm interested in is that what is the probability of the output given the input? I want to describe the probability of the events, probability of the outcomes. Um, I only list uh, the challenges that this uh, answer the question will involve and show one example of uh, having a model that can overcome these challenges and could um, the result that, that, that can model can provide and then that will be everything uh, for this uh, presentation. So the, the challenges that we have. First of all, it, it will be the high dimensionality of the, in, the input. The visual scene, you would say for if you have maybe a thousand by thousand pixelated um, representation of the visual scene, you will have uh, one million pixels. So across location, you will have this much of um, information to process. And this information comes across time and the resolution of our brain processing is sub millisecond. Uh, or even our eye movements resolution is um, a millisecond. So you will say even in one second of the experiment or um, how we measure uh, when the me measure the brain activity, we could have thousand samples over time just in one second. Um, so one uh, thousand in time times one million in location, so one million samples in location, um, you have one billion of information for one second of experiment in one neuron. So when, when the, 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 the thing is presented and it's going to be, this, the output of the neuron is going to be described based on this input. Um, similarly for the output of the brain, it is also a high dimensional a signal because the neurons um, have, uh, I mean, they are responding um, in millisecond time resolution. Um, so each of these zeros and ones happen um, every um, two, three millisecond. Uh, so in one, again, second of recording, you will have thousand sample on millisecond time resolution. And you have um, many neurons, tens of neurons, hundreds of neurons when you are recording from the brain. And the brain itself as a whole has 10 million neurons, but when we are recording, we have only access to a small patches of neurons, even single neurons. So um, in that sense, over time and across neurons population, you will have a high dimensionality. The other thing that I already uh, mentioned is the stochasticity of the response. So we have variability across trials of the experiment. Another um, feature of the response is that it is discrete. Any modeling, um, framework and nowadays will be challenged by discrete signal um, so it is discrete in time it is even discrete in value we are talking about zeros and ones so even the value is discretized and the, um, these signals are sparse so you can see that how uh, few ones that we have across uh, for example this uh, thousand millisecond Okay, so the uh, events are very sparse, so we have very limited samples to describe the input, the translation or transformation of the input and the output. And the system in between, uh, which, should, uh, which is expected to mimic the brain processing or replace the brain processing, uh, has this uh, difficulty, this set of difficulties at least, just to mention a few. And the system varying over time, as I said, when you are fixating, your uh, visual processing is different when you are moving your eyes. Otherwise, you will see these jumps in your processing. This is as you move your eyes on millisecond time scale, the system pr um, uh, uh, processing and properties and characteristics should change over time. The system is um, non-linear, as you can imagine. Um, and the system that we are going to um, describe here or develop here should be predictive, meaning that it should not be able to only describe the visual input that are used for training uh, this system or the model representing this system. 
it should also be able to generalize beyond the training data set because for the perception, the uh, decoding part uh, that is going to um, give us the perceived stimulus will rely on something that brain uh, haven't seen. Uh, so far, or this uh, system, uh, not that brain, this system that is going to replace the brain uh, has, has an, haven't seen uh, so far. Uh, and uh, at the end of the day, whatever we are going to put here should be biologically plausible to be uh, insightful about the brain processing and not just some computational system that you can, or computational model that you cannot project it to any um, biophysical part or component of the, of the brain or any um, communication in the brain. So you want to have all these properties for the least. Um, and this is um, just an example. Let's say we have that model, and that model is varying over time, and it is um, it has uh, nonlinearity involved, it has stochasticity involved, it, it has it, ha it has even um, feedback processing, and lots of things. And just a schematic of the model that I'm going to describe. And once I understand the probability of output given input, I will ha I will have the encoding model. Um, and then using the encoding model, the idea is that the idea is that we use uh, that model and ask the inverse question. So we ask the model the, uh, if the output is, for example, this set of zeros and one, what you think your input is. And the answer of the model will be the decoded stimulus, will be the perceived stimulus, will be the, uh, the re read out perception, visual perception. So this is the general approach that uh, we are pursuing in our lab using uh, measurements from the um, um, brain in macaque monkeys. And we also do behavioral experiments in monkeys and in humans uh, to validate the prediction of the model and by closing the loop, we can understand how uh, visual scene is represented in zeros and ones in the brain during eye movement and how zeros and ones are translated into the perception of the visual scene again during eye movement. And so here I'm just uh, going to show the results one of the preliminary results of this approach. Um, and, and this is basically if we use that, if we develop that model and use that model for decoding, um, you can understand uh, this, um, again, this example of information from the single neuron. So let's say you have a neuron whose receptive field is in this part of the scene. When um, the whole mesh here will represent the um, X and Y and direction in the visual scene, the horizontal and vertical axis in the visual scene. When uh, eyes are um, fixated here, so here is the schematic of the eye, is the location of the fixation point, and the animal is going to move its eyes uh, from um, here uh, to here during the uh, eye movement task. And I want to see how the neurons processing will change against single neuron. And on this direction, uh, it's the latency of the neurons, how, um, uh, and whatever um, the information, how much in the past the neuron is um, responding to <clears throat> at a specific time of the eye movement, and that time is labeled um, as a title of this um, image. So here you can see time from the onset of the eye movement, um, and this will change from negative time all the way to zero, which will be the exact time of the um, eye movement and it goes to positive values which is after the eyes have moved and it will be landed at this location. So I just play this video and you can see how the latency of the neuron and how the location of the neuron that is processing during eye movement will change. So here during fixation the neuron is processing this part of the scene and the latency of 60 milliseconds meaning that a stimulus that presented 60 milliseconds before from this time and that is printed on the top and uh, will be received by this neuron. Before eyes start to move, the neurons start processing, that single neuron start processing this part of the scene as well. And this part of the scene is where the eyes are landed um, after a few milliseconds. But the neurons could predictively process this location of the scene even before the eyes have moved. So when the eyes, now this is, you see the zero here, this is the time of the eye movement. Now the eyes start to move and in, on this episode, eyes are on the fly and you can see that the neurons is, uh, had, can process two parts of the scene. One is the location of the receptive field before eye movement. One is the location of the receptive field after eyes are uh, landing. 
um, and then uh, the latency of the stimulus that is processed by the neuron, it will be different. Um, and then here we also see that there is a third part of the visual scene that the neurons also respond to, and that is the area um, uh, around the um, uh, location, uh, new location of the gaze. And you can see sometimes this uh, receptive field area uh, during fixation one is appearing with all these uh, latencies are different. So th the um, bottom line is that, or um, the take home message is that during eye movement, even one single neuron can process information from different parts of the scene. When those information, um, those sets of information have been presented at different time points um, in, in, the, in the past. Okay? And, and you can now think of how um, downstream areas that are listening to these neurons, to this, to this single neuron could be confused. When that neuron respond, when the eyes uh, were fixating, it was meaning that, let's go to the beginning of the, it was meaning that this area of the scene, something has, uh, has been presented and it was 60 milliseconds before the current time. But during eye movement, when the neuron, that same neuron respond, what the downstream neuron could infer is the stimulus in this part of the scene presented that neurons is responding to, the stimulus was in here, it was in here, it was 60 milliseconds before, it was um, whatever, let me, go to some other samples, it was 70 milliseconds uh, before, 100 milliseconds before, um, 150 milliseconds ago. Um, so you can imagine that the decoding process in the brain, how it will be um, complicated. So here we are talking about a statistical encoding and a statistical inference. Okay? Uh, so the, in, in computational terms, we are um, solving two problems simultaneously. Um, model estimation and uh, inference. Model estimation is how visual input is represented in the neuron responses like this, and uh, um, in, in the neuron responses like this. And uh, the decoding part or the inference is how um, that response will be translated into perception of the scene across time and location. Um, so with that, this is the summary of the approach that I have been uh, describing here and the one that we are pursuing in our lab. Um, so when we go from the um, um, input to the output of the neuron during encoding, and it, it, it uses the physiological recording and causal experiments for confirmation or for validation of the um, encoding and uh, the uh, inverse uh, problem, which goes from the um, output to the perceived input and the validation of the model prediction will be to psychophysical studies in human and in monkeys. And the whole idea is that the understanding of this constructive aspect of the vision, um, which happens constantly during eye movement, how brain constructs the visual world for us, how it, um, which is an example of um, uh, flexibility and robustness to large changes in the visual scene and uh, to uh, at, across time in millisecond time resolution. If once we have this understanding, uh, so we can have, um, uh, get, we can get closer to understanding the neural mechanisms and circuitry of our visual perception. And um, another goal of the lab is just to translate uh, this understanding, um, how we uh, decode neural responses to um, infer the perception. We use that for brain machine, inter visual brain machine interfaces or visual motor brain machine interfaces and uh, prosthetic uh, systems uh, for um, people with impaired uh, visual or visual motor uh, functions. And uh, that understanding will also um, help us uh, to and get closer to the human-like artificial intelligence. If you have a computer vision applications that can um, mimic or um, emulate um, the capability of the brain and the perceptual um, and capability of the brain to some extent. So these are the uh, research directions in our lab. And with that, I will uh, thank all of the uh, members of the lab and the funding agencies and uh, if you have any questions, uh, I would be happy to take it down. Thank you. And a very insightful uh, presentation.
Uh, well, uh, I asked the audience if I uh, uh, have uh, any question to type in the chat. Uh, for the first one, uh, I go first. Uh, when uh, we say that uh, being, uh, uh, if we don't have this statistic uh, motions uh, of the eye, if the brain is actually blind. Does it imply that uh, all of this uh, current deep learning networks that uh, apply to still images are kind of cannot understand the image and that's why they uh, perform very poorly in the, uh, the real world? Um, yeah, I mean, there are many aspects um, why, um, for example, this um, capability of the brain may not be um, and doable in the uh, artificial system. One aspect is time and the, um, maybe I'll go to the thank you pages. Um, one, one aspect is uh, the time um, dimension that most of artificial system miss. So the information that we are, that's going to be processed and um, in terms of encoding and decoding is represented over time. It's not just location. If you ignore the time dimension, you are missing and that um, neural code or and you are missing the, al the uh, actual algorithm underlying all of this processing because that algorithm uh, has been defined over time. It is not just one snapshot of the things that the information is presented there. So one thing is that the time dimension is missing um, that contribute um, to um, for um, artificial visual system uh, to fall short um, with respect to the uh, our, our natural uh, perceptual capability. Um, and the other thing um, is the um, high dimensionality of this processing, uh, again, across uh, time and space um, and locations and, and number of neurons, the neural populations, again, which is a challenge for this system. So they are going to simplify in that direction. But once you um, lower your resolution in time, lower your resolution across space um, or across, across your um, sample um, neurons, across the population, then you are missing information as well. So I, I'm just here um, emphasizing that how a high resolution processing or computational um, uh, framework uh, across time and space um, will be important. Um, and this is uh, the maybe main factors um, that are missing in artificial uh, systems. I, I can list a, a lot more, but these are related to what I presented. Okay.